Energy with naturopath and medical intuitive Dr. Rita Louise. We have learned from Einstein's theories that matter and energy are one. Physicists believe that all systems in nature have their own particular way of vibrating. From the swing of a pendulum to the waves in the ocean to the light that brightens the sky each day, each of these oscillates at its own unique rate. In the same way, things such as rocks and minerals vibrate very slowly and at speeds that are imperceptible to us. Living things such as plants, animals, and man vibrate faster and appear to be alive. The same holds true for every thought, feeling, event, or word we speak. Each has its own frequency or rate of vibration. What many of us don't realize is if we take everything in our own universe down to its simplest form, it is all just energy. Join Dr. Rita as she explores questions such as, what are we made of? Why do we get sick? How can I live a more balanced and whole life? Call in and talk to her and her thought-provoking guests. Send us your questions and get the help you need to move beyond any obstacle or challenges that may be affecting your life, right from the source. So stay tuned and explore your possibilities. Hello and welcome to Just Energy Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Rita Levine, and thank you all for tuning into the show today. Just Energy Radio is brought to you by SoulHealer.com and the Institute of Applied Energetics. That's AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com, where you can learn to become a medical intuitive, energy medicine practitioner, or intuitive counselor. Just Energy Radio is also broadcast live on Fate Radio. That's FateRadio.com and can be heard on iTunes. And there are some shows that are actually starting to show up on YouTube. So if you want to keep track of what's going on, uh, check out those sites, or you can go to www.justenergyradio.com and check out our over four years worth of archives, or sign up for our free uh, newsletter, which will keep you up to date with who's coming on to the show next. It's all cool. Anyway, today we have, it's an interesting show. In the first hour, we're going to be speaking to Fred Allen Wolf about his new book, Time Loops and Space Twists. And in the second hour, we're going to be speaking to Sonia Barrett about mastering the matrix of the mind. Let me tell you a little bit about Fred, and we're going to get him on to find out all about time loops and space twists. Fred Allen Wolf is a physicist, writer, and lecturer who earned his Ph.D. in theoretical physics at UCLA in 1963. He continues to write lecture throughout the world, and conduct research on the relationship of quantum physics to consciousness. He is the author of 11 books, including Taking the Quantum Leap, Parallel Universes, The Dreaming Universe, and his latest book, Time Loose and Space Twist, How God Created the Universe. So please welcome to Just Energy Radio, Fred Allen Wolf. Hey, Fred, how are you? Hi, Rita. Thank you very much for having me on your show. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Um, One of the things that I like to do when I have a a new guest on the show is just spend a couple of minutes kind of doing a little introduction. Let me ask this question. Of all the things you could have possibly done in your life, why theoretical physics? Why did you choose that path? Well, that's a, a, an interesting question. Uh, I've looked at, I've actually looked at that over uh, a couple of uh, times being interviewed, and it it really turns out that I was born with a kind of curiosity. Um, I was always interested in how things came together, or how they worked, or what made this that way. Uh, so that was a kind of an inborn curiosity that I had. Um, I also was interested in magic, in performance magic, where uh, tricksters would get up and do these tricks, and people would go, oh, wow, that's like a miracle. And so the combination of these two things led me to thinking about, well, how does this universe appear? What made it appear? And I I really started thinking about this at a very er probably early stage. Uh, I was particularly engrossed with the uh, first... uh, movie shows of the atomic bomb blast which took place at Alamogordo, New Mexico the we we I think in 1945 just after uh 
the uh, bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, uh, newsreels were shown of the of the bomb blast tests that were carried out earlier at Alamogordo, New Mexico, and I got very interested in my God, how did it, where did that energy come from? What is energy? What's going? So those kind of questions were within my bailiwick for quite some time. So it was pretty natural for me to get into physics because that was uh, that was the natural place to go if you were looking for those kinds of answers. See, I think that's interesting because you know I I, I say that I'm an energy girl because I really I'm a medical intuitive and so I like looking at the energy of people and the energy of dynamics, which is why this show is called just energy but i you know my path has been more from a holistic spiritual side as opposed to the science side um let me ask you this you you heard the introduction to the show and obviously you must figure out that i believe that our universe is all just energy but from a quantum physics from a scientific point of view has that proven itself to be true well, let me ask you a question before I answer your question. What's energy? Okay. Energy is vibration, you know, and is being vibration of what? vibrate. Vibration of what? What's vibrating? Uh, you see, we're getting that's... into questions now. When we use terminology, uh, people accept certain words because they have some sort of intuitive grasp of the idea. But actually, energy is a far more mysterious quality of our universe than just simply calling it a term. Uh, this often happens when we have something mysterious, we just give a name to it and think it'll go away, but it doesn't go away. Uh, <laughs> energy really is, in a kind of sense, undefinable. Um, a physicist would define it in terms of the ability to do work or to uh, m cause movement uh, from rest or to make something move which hadn't been moving before. Uh, energy is a quality which uh, makes things animated or brings animation into them. And because energy is that quality which makes things animated, we have to ask, well, what is it that is making things animated? What is the thing itself? And then we get into all kinds of tongue-tying definitions which really eventually just circle back on themselves. For example, before Einstein came on the uh, scene, energy was thought to be pretty much something that couldn't be created nor destroyed. It was always constant. Uh, but then, and, and we only thought of energy in terms of what I just told you. But then when Einstein came on the scene, we found out that energy was really the same thing as mass. And mass was the same thing as inertia. And inertia was the same thing as the thing which gets energy when you apply some forces to it. So then we get into this kind of circle of just what do we mean by energy? What do we mean by mass? What do we mean by all that? Well, the fact that energy and mass are the same, what is that telling us? And so these are the kinds of questions that physicists love to get into. And so uh, when we get into is energy is the energy the basis for the whole universe? Well, in a certain sense, it is. But when we actually look at what it is this, that we're talking about, then we get into some very interesting refinements of the concept, which uh, I tend to uh, do a lot of, refining of concepts. And what I look at is not energy so much as being the fundamental, but actually, and this is going to blow your mind, mind is more fundamental than any than even energy and that what we see as energy somehow comes out from an activity which we believe or what I tend to speculate from quantum physics is coming from mind okay I have to kind of think on that one um, let me kind of come back in a different way are you saying mind as brain or mind as consciousness well, I'm saying really mind is consciousness, but again, the question okay. then comes, when we say consciousness or mind, we often equate that, as you just did, with, say, brain. 
Uh, and what I'm saying is that there's something called mind which exists or which can exist as some kind of potential for making energy which is not just in the brain but the brain itself is composed of it. In other words, what I'm saying is there's something called a mind field which pervades the whole universe and really got started when the Big Bang got started and that this mind field is actually the generator of all of the matter that appeared in the universe, including brains, and therefore the brain is maybe nothing more than a receiving transmitting matrix for this mind field. And when we have the experiences of this transmission emission of this mind field through our brains, we have the sensation of being alive and thinking or feeling or sensing or intuiting or all the kinds of things that you get into with people uh, that you treat. Isn't that what Dr. Goswami terms God, that underlying consciousness that forms everything that no one can touch or feel or quantify, at least at this point in time? You know, that, you know, the cosmic conscious that kind of underlies reality. Well, that may be what he's referring to. However, uh, each physicist or each thinker that approaches the problem usually approaches it from a particular point of view, and sometimes the points of view are coincident. And in many cases, Dr. Goswami and myself coincide with our points of view. But there are maybe some differences. And uh, uh, maybe what I would say is mind or the mind field or the mind of God uh, is in some way different from what he says. I, I, I don't really want to get into uh, what right. our differences are, but I can explain to you what I mean. Okay. And, and it wasn't about differences. I was just putting out that concept of God. That was my Sure. Thing. Go ahead. So what do you mean? <laughs> well, okay. Uh, in order to tell you what I mean, I think we should begin by telling you a story. And one okay. of the best stories in the universe is Once Upon a Time. And that's that's the only – those that's the whole story, Once Upon a Time. That tells you everything. Because what that's saying is that we – have to understand or we have to deal with something we call time. Time is the guide, the line, the line in the sand, the matrix, the whole kit and caboodle out of which we make sense of our lives. We talk about beginning. We talk about middle. We talk about end. We talk about past. We talk about present. We talk about future. All of these have a sense of time. Even our language is structured around the concept of time. So we say, for example, I am, but I was, I will be. All of those have a sense of time, a sense of time accomplished, time right now, and time that may happen in the future. These are all senses of time, and yet when we try to define time, we're right back to where we started from before, we just simply have no way of defining it without introducing it as a concept in the first place. So, with that much in mind, let's begin our story. Once upon a time, there was something called a Big Bang. Now, what was the Big Bang? Again, Big Bang, most people think of, and I've even maybe said sometimes in my books or on radio shows or whatever, the Big Bang seems to have been an explosion of great energy pouring forth from empty space. And that is not really what actually happened. There wasn't an explosion of things pouring forth into empty space. It was empty space itself exploding into existence from a nothingness or an emptiness which is undefinable, mysterious, whatever you want to call it. That empty space itself we call the Big Bang, 
And when that happened, it started to expand. And you can think of it, and this is only a, a visual metaphor, you can think of it as if you took a balloon and began to blow it up and looked at the surface of the balloon itself and pretended that that surface was what is meant by space so that as the balloon expands and grows, you can think of the space is expanding and growing. And that's kind of how we think of what happened at the Big Bang, is that space itself, like the surface of the balloon, was expanding and growing. And then something else happened, which we don't really know how, but in the beginning there was light. And if you read the Bible, the very first page of the Bible, it says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now, mystics and spiritual teachers and Kabbalists and Islamic mystics and psychics and people who study the meaning of sacred texts are often amazed that this simple beginning God says light two times, let there be and there was. Now, this is God. Why would God have to mention the word light two times? Why two times? Why twice? And now we go back to the Big Bang story, and what we find here is equally as fascinating as this really biblical tale. In the beginning, there was light, but not just one kind of light, there was actually two kinds of light that emerged in the Big Bang. Now, this kind of light, because there were two different kinds, I'm going to give a name to it because we often use the word light normally to mean the light that we see with our eyes, the light that comes from a light bulb when we turn it on or when we look at the sun or something of that sort. That is certainly a kind of light. That's certainly light. But this other kind of light I'm talking about is something a little different. So I'm going to give a name to both kinds of light to give it a, put it in a box. We're going to call both kinds of light luxon. Luxon is a, you know, the word lux is the Latin word for light. So a luxon is like a particle or something of light. Okay. There are two kinds. Now, one kind is the kind we already know about. That's the light we see with our eyes. And we have studied that kind of light, and we've noticed that this light has a property. It's like spinning. And it, you can think of it as like a diver diving off the diving board and doing a twist. It's, it's spinning, and it spins in a very normal kind of way. It goes through one complete turn and comes right back to where it started from. But there was another kind of light that was emitted. And this kind of light we call half-spin light. And this is a bit weirder. If you turn it all, it, it also turns and spins, but when it goes around once, it doesn't get back to where it starts from. It has to go around another complete time before it finally ends up where it started from. We call that half-spinning. And it's something which is hard to imagine, but it's very relevant in quantum physics. Now, this kind of stuff, this kind of half-spinning light, whatever you want to call it, turned out that it was indeed moving at the speed of light. But then something else happened. And this is where this happened maybe a few billionths of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. Suddenly a field appeared. This field physicists are currently looking for at the Large Hadron Collider and they're looking for it at Fermilab and other laboratories where they have colliding kind of particles banging into each other. This field is called the Higgs field, H-I-G-G-S. And what happened is that the half-spin light stuff began to interact with the Higgs field, and in doing this, it started doing a kind of zigzag dance in which it was re like reflecting on, on itself in a mirror. And when it did that, it, it appeared to slow down. It was doing a zigzag, but appeared to be slowing down. And what that meant is that it began to look as if it had mass, matter. It became massive. And 
we now know that every particle in the universe, every particle in the universe that we know of, everything we know, is made of mass, and it's all half-spin mass, and there are certain kinds of half-spin mass that we see. There are electrons. There are also something we call muons. There are neutrinos. And there's something we call quarks. And the quarks make up the nucleus of every atom. The electrons make up all the electronic stuff that makes radio programs possible and even makes human life possible, makes atoms possible. All of that's going on. All is coming about because the luxonic particles of your self, your body, of the whole universe, is doing zigzag dancing with this field we call the Higgs field. I call it the mind of God. And what we're looking at is a light show taking place in the mind of God. And that precisely is what we mean by energy. Question. Okay, you said, and I, I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to with the Higgs field, but um, you were talking about consciousness and consciousness forming with the Big Bang. Are you saying that there is no consciousness that superseded the Big Bang? And I maybe have a follow-up question, but no, no consciousness superseding the Big Bang that actually set that into motion in the first place? I have no way of knowing if there was anything outside of the Big Bang because everything I know comes about from what we can study, I and mean, that is a physicist. I can guess, I can speculate that, of course, there was the consciousness of the mind, there was God before the Big Bang, but that doesn't really answer any questions. That just puts it off. That, okay. makes, just, to, that just labels a mystery by saying, oh, well, God had consciousness. But, you know, it doesn't really solve, that doesn't... That may, that may satisfy you, but it doesn't really solve any problems. It, it won't help with anything, really. So what I'm saying is that the field of consciousness is this Higgs field, which is the mind of God, and it's responsible for giving matter its presence. And the second part, which I didn't tell you about yet, this is, another, this is a speculation now, that it's also responsible for the presence of mind itself, that it itself is a mind, and it's capable of using these two kinds of light to have experiences that we would call mindful activity, of which your brain is taking part right now. And that's just still in theoretical terms? As far, I mean, is there math to support that and calculations to support yes, that, or are people just kind of playing around with that idea? No, no. These, the everything that I talk about is based upon physics understanding, quantum physics understanding, and the story I told you about the Big Bang and the Higgs field and the matter. That's all mathematized. That's all mathematical. That's mathematically theoretical. There are experiments going on which tend to uh, support that point of view. Uh, there's even mathematics to support the speculations that I'm giving about it being a minefield. And I can explain why it's called, why it's acting like a minefield if you want to know, uh, but that'll take us into a little more quantum physics to really get what I'm talking about. But it's all based upon mathematical reasoning. Almost everything that I ever say, any statement that I make, is not just a statement off the top of my head that's just words with nothing to support it. I'm always looking at what the theoretical physics ideas from quantum physics are telling me. And any theoretical physics idea is a mathematical idea which is capable of eventually emerging as an experimental fact, even though we may not have the facts well in mind yet. Okay. Great. What I find interesting in your book, uh, Time Loops and Space Twists, you open the book, you do your introduction talking about the Baha Gavita and the yoga, yoga cycles, etc., etc. And I always 
I find it personally interesting, and I'd like to hear your commentary, that, in my opinion, the ancients knew a whole lot more. I mean, even you're, you know, talking about in the Bible where it says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. It seems like they knew a lot about quantum physics that we're just rediscovering. Well, I know, I wouldn't say they knew a lot about quantum physics because there's no real evidence that they knew that. There was certainly evidence that they had a spiritual, deep understanding uh, of possibly how uh, the universe is created without necessarily getting into the details of quantum physics. Uh, right. How the Bible got written and uh, some of the interpretations of the Bible, uh, which are... Uh, part and parcel of uh, mystical t understanding and teaching, uh, that's a mystery to me. Uh, I'm always amazed to find that there are some things in, uh, in the, uh, particularly in the Hebrew version of the Bible, not in the English translation, uh, like the King James Version or something like that, but in the original Hebrew language, as best as I can tell, there are interesting insights which... Uh, can be discovered if you understand some of the basic principles of Kabbalah. Uh, and that also, when I read into them, and this may just because I'm reading into them, uh, it indicates to me that there's some basic understanding of the principles of quantum physics without necessarily understanding quantum physics. If, you, if I can make that clear, I'm not sure if that's a clear enough statement. Oh, it's clear to me. I mean, I understand the concepts without having to do the math part. <laughs> so, see, they taught at a level that works for me really good. Okay. Um, Fred, we have two minutes to we need to take our break, so I'm going to ask you kind of a silly question, which should fill up this little piece of time, and then we'll come back and get serious again. But a question I'm asked because of the name of the show, and um, and I'm sure you're asked this question, and I'm just going to throw it out there. With the assumption that we're made of energy and particles of light and we're this vibrating mass, the question that I'm asked, and I'm going to ask you is, how come we can't walk through walls? Or how come we can sit in a chair and we don't fall through? And well, it's, because we're, question, made, it, it's, it's because we're made the way we're made that we can't do it. It's a good thing. Because uh, if we did do all of that kind of stuff, then we wouldn't have any matter. If you were just pure, if there wasn't any interaction with the Higgs field, you would do that. You would just helter skelter go through everything. You would, you would, you wouldn't. The gravity wouldn't hold you up. You just continually move. You'd be all over the universe. Uh, nothing would be holding you together. And uh, what kind of life would that be? Well, I mean, I guess in the really bigger perspective, if everything was that way, there wouldn't be any walls to walk through in the first place. That's exactly right. There wouldn't be any such thing as a wall because the coherence which makes matter matter is dependent upon the interrelationship of these half-spinning particles with the Higgs field. They cohere. They produce then patterns. They produce remarkable patterns. Even the simplest atom, which we can think of, which is an atom of hydrogen, has a pattern in which there are an infinite number of variations of just the simplest possible, simplest possible atomic structure you can have. Because of the great infinity of all these different possible patterns, when you take two atoms and put them together, they can form a molecule, and the patterns that they generate are nothing like anything the atom can generate. And if you take a whole bunch of them and put them together so that you make things like a human cell, it's amazing the different kind of patterning. And there's an integrity that comes about because of this patterning, which keeps things from flying apart and keeps things from just passing through each other like ghosts. And that's well, I was going to ask answer. you about ghosts, maybe if we had time later. But uh, sure. the music's going to come up. So we're going to take a quick break. I'm Dr. Rita Louise. Oh, let me let it get into the next part. Uh, we're here talking to Fred Allen Wolf about his new book, Time Loops and Space Twist, How God Created the Universe. His website is fredallenwolf.com, and we'll be back with Fred after these words from our sponsors. Just energy.
Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. Hi, I'm Dr. Rita Louise, the founder of the Institute of Applied Energetics. Start a new career today on the leading edge of alternative health and healing. The Institute of Applied Energetics can help you to develop the specialized skills you'll need to work as an energy medicine practitioner, intuitive counselor, or professional medical intuitive. Besides our outstanding technical instruction, our programs also support you in creating and building a successful business in this rapidly growing field. Be a catalyst for changing the way healthcare is done around the world. Contact the Institute of Applied Energetics right away or visit AppliedEnergeticsInstitute.com. Balance in all things is critical to maintaining health. In the hectic drive of today's world, Many of us forget to take care of our most important asset, ourselves. At ProductsForTheSoul.com, we want to support your effort to nurture yourself. We offer a wide variety of herbs, supplements, and high-quality, ready-to-eat, all-natural foods. We even offer holographic chip technology products that can augment the body's natural ability to increase energy, improve sleep, and mitigate pain. Best of all, all of our products are delivered straight to your door. It's time to start loving yourself. Visit productsforthesoul.com and let us help you along the way. Back to Just Energy Radio with Dr. Rita Louise. Hello and welcome back to Just Energy Radio. I'm Dr. Rita Louise. And we're here talking to Fred Allen Wolf about his new book, Time Loops and Space Twists. His webpage is fredallenwolf.com. Fred, let's... Um, Let's go here. Okay, so we have these little particles, and they're going around and looping around and doing all of these things. And then what happens to How does it start to congeal and actually make the universe that we actually observe? And one of the things that I've seen on TV is, is string theory. Are we talking about string theory actually making... You know, I like to think of it as little particles, or is this something completely different? Well, it's not completely different. String theory is just another uh, – a, it's a, a theory which tries to look at the structure of what's called a particle. Um, uh, these particles have structure. They have, a, they have properties. Uh, for example, they, they spin. Um, they uh, spin like ice skaters spin or something like that, or divers when they do a, a gyrating uh, spin. So they seem to have some kind of integrity of their own. Whether they're integrity, whether they're little strings that are spinning or whatever, that's just another picture. And string theory is an attempt to, tr to try to make sense of what those things are actually doing. But... We really don't really, uh, nobody really has a picture of what a particle, a fundamental particle, looks like. What we do have is pictures of what happens when you get lots of them together. Then they begin to form things that we can see. And by see, I mean using, using the instrumentations we have for vision, such as the eyeball. For example, I can see uh, a dust moat. That's a very small kind of particle, but I can see it. Uh, even with my naked eye, if the sun's hitting it in the right way, I certainly can see a baseball or I can see another human being walking toward me or a car or a stoplight. Those are pretty what are called macroscopic things. They're made of billions upon billions upon billions 
of atoms and molecules cohering together to form what are called solids. So there's a whole realm of study of piecing all of this together as to how fundamental objects like particles become macroscopic objects like automobiles and uh, the hair on your head. You know, one of the things that you talk about in the book, and we talked a little bit about, is the whole concept of time. When talking about matter or particles or light, what does time have to do with any of that? Well, time is the uh, the the arena or the basis on which we determine when and where things happen. Physics is a study of what's happening, where it's happening, when it's happening. That's it. That's what physics studies. That's what physicists are interested in. What's happening, where it's happening, when it's happening. So one of those things is the when, and that has to do with time. Another thing is the where, and that has to do with space. And the other thing has to do with what, and that has to do with action, or as you put it, energy. I think a better word rather than energy as being fundamental, is that action is fundamental. Action is the is a quality which involves a relationship. It involves something acting upon something else. Uh, in the movies, lights, camera, action. Without action, there's no actor. There are no act, there's no action. There's nothing to watch. There's no story to be told. Action is what compels the story. It's what moves it forward. It's what tells us that we're watching something in space and in time. So action is pretty fundamental, and in physics, it's a fundamental unit. And uh, in fact, we calculate everything that we do from an action principle, and that's uh, uh, something which hasn't quite caught on with the general lay audience because it's not something which is easy to talk about. Uh, either is energy, but somehow we've used the term energy. For example, we burn oil to make our or burn gasoline to make our cars run. Uh, where we talk about energy crisis and so forth. So we have some kind of conceptual things. Um, actually, when we're talking about human beings, what we really are dealing with is an action crisis. People not taking the right actions at the right times and the right places or taking inappropriate actions at the so-called wrong times and wrong places, which then gets them into various kinds of difficulties and troubles. And uh, I suppose in your field, dealing with uh, intuitive uh, counseling and uh, healing, uh, getting people to take the right actions at the right time at the right places is really what it's all about. It's what it's all about, but <laughs> that's the challenging part, is getting people to do what they need to do in order to heal. Exactly. Um, getting people to do what they have to do. And and what uh, what what I try to do is, is try to explain to people, well, look, here's the universe, here's, here's how it's made. You're, you're simply, you're light in the mind of God, and you have the ability to change all the stuff that's going on. Uh, you're not just something heavy and inert. You're not just a slug uh, leaving a slime trail through life, <laughs> but you're a light body, and that means that you're capable of really transforming and changing a lot of stuff that's going on, including your own life. And I, I don't mean to go off topic here, but what about things like thoughts, feelings, or the concept of the law of attraction? I mean, we're talking about I'm going to say energy because I don't have a better word. Um, That's okay. That is sent out into the universe. Has 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 physics or science started to look at that to come up with any hard, I'm going to say, data to support those concepts? No. The law of attraction is really uh, – how, how can I say it? In, in a way, it's a it's a it's a – it's 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 important to get people motivated to do something with their lives and if believing that some magical genie is out there to grant your wishes uh provided you take action well then it serves a good purpose but 
if you're just going to sit back and just wish for things to happen uh, and then expect them to happen to you, uh, you're most likely going to be out of luck. I mean, I can't say that everybody that sits down and wishes for a million dollars at this moment, that every one of you is not going to get a million dollars. I can't say that. It's very possible that one of you will get a million dollars because your great aunt Maud just passed on and left it to you or some other crazy thing <laughs> like that happened or you won the lotto or something like that. I anything is possible. But for the most of us, uh, in order for us to really receive, to get on with our life, uh, we have to take action. So the correct thing is are there laws of physics which support the actions we take in the world and how our mindful activity coupled with those actions, are there laws which, which tell us how that works? And the answer is yes. And that's what quantum physics is really all about. It's not about wishing and hoping for things to happen. It's understanding what and how your actions have a role in the universe. It's not just thinking good stuff. It's thinking and taking proper action. Oh, very much so. I, there are so many people that, you know, say their affirmations and make their vision board and then they, you know, get an insight or whatever and don't do anything with it and, and they wonder why nothing's working. It's like, well, because they're not either. <laughs> That's it. Um, and I think that there's a tendency for people to 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 kind of mis to mis to misunderstand that. Um one of your books is about parallel universe, and I just I had a question. Since I had you on the show, I was like, hey, I can I can ask. There's been a lot of talk about parallel universes and multiverses, and I totally am on board with that multiverse multiverse idea, especially when you compare it to you know the Big Bang and you know the Big Bang creating our multiverse in the same way that uh, Vishnu you know, created the egg or the bubble, you know, from the lotus blossom, which you talk about in your book. And, I mean, I mean that whole vision of all these little bubble multiverses floating around uh, fascinates me. I, I wanted to ask this. What's the difference between parallel universes and multiverses? Well, or are we talking the same thing? Well, actually, they're just another way of saying the same thing. Parallel universes is kind of a maybe oxymoronic kind of term. I mean, a universe is a one thing. So how can there be universes? Already we're into oxymoronic trouble because uh, the universe is supposed to be everything, so there, there can't be another everything. How can there be two everythings? So the word multiverse is to get us out of the notion of universe, one verse, there's now many verses. So that's where the term comes from. I still like parallel universes because I like the fact that it's oxymoronic. I like the fact that, it's confu that, that it makes people think in terms of, of uh, well, like frames of a comic book and you have uh, uh, a whole bunch of or movie frames and you just have not just one movie but you have a whole bunch of movies running together and uh, if you look through one frame you see one universe if you look through another frame you see another universe and if you look through both frames together as they're running by you you see a kind of superposition of universes or what we might call a multiverse so it's these are all basically the same thing it's just a matter of uh, how you want to describe them I thought, and, and in your viewpoint, let me ask it this way. In your viewpoint, do you ascribe to the, if I make this choice today, then it's going to split off and create some parallel universe that Hitler's still alive because somebody made a choice 50 years ago and, you know, whatever. Um, or are you talking more about separate, discrete universes that have their own separate laws of physics that might be different from ours, might be similar to ours. No, I'm not talking about that. Or the Both, both choices are uh, probably uh, incorrect conceptions. Um, okay. First of all, just because you choose to do something, say, choose to do A rather than B, doesn't necessarily mean that the A universe that you just decided to go into 
uh, is the one where Hitler's still alive. Uh, that's a whole other set of, of conditions which would make that happen. Most of the universes in which we choose to do something rather than another are so similar to the one in which we haven't made the choice yet that we can barely tell the difference. For all practical purposes, there's just one universe. And most of the choices that we make don't really change what's happening in the world that we're in. Uh, we don't just jump into a magical universe in which everything is helter-skelter. That just doesn't happen. Uh, uh, so uh, you have to understand that there's a context for uh, in, for uh, choices to be made. And within that context, the choices that you make, whether A or B, um, would still fit in within the original context of that universe in which you were making those choices, in which most of that rest of that universe is not affected at all by the fact that you chose or didn't choose to make a certain choice. So it, uh, it, it, it's, it's much more stable than just that. Um, but the fact that there are multi-universe or multiverse or parallel universes, that's pretty much, pretty much substantiated. Uh, many quantum physics, physics physicists today actually believe that that's really what's going on. Um, but uh, they understand that uh, there's a greater context. And there's not a belief that there are potentially different laws of physics existing in these other universes? Well, there may be other universes that got generated at the time of the Big Bang alongside of the one that we happen to be in. And our universe is continually splitting by every random act of consciousness or so forth that is taking place by every human being here, but even though there's billions upon billions upon billions upon billions of splits going on, most of those con most of the context for those splits still stays stable as one universe. But if there were another universe that split off at the time of the, the Big Bang or whatever, in which the laws of physics were different, there's some notion that that might have occurred. But because those universes in which the laws of physics might have been different, uh, they may be very different than ours. We don't know. We don't know anything else. We generally believe that the laws of physics are pretty much inviolate and that they will be the same in all universes and that the law is probably stronger, uh, more robust uh, as a conceptual basis for reality than, uh, uh, let's say, a scoff law kind of universe. Yeah, I just watch too much TV. <laughs> there was a show on string theory on TV, and they were talking about multiverses and the possibility that, or what they were putting out was, gravity was weak in our universe because in a neighboring universe, gravity was much stronger, and we were feeling the effects of gravity that was coming off this other universe. I'm just well, there is a I theory uh, that, that, oh, okay. that this is a... Uh, an offshoot of what's called string theory. Uh, I did not write about this in my book, Time Loops and Space Twist, because gravity is still <clears throat> a kind of a mystery. And I really confess that I don't understand it well enough yet to explain what's going on. String theorists and ooh, the kind of thing you're just talking about, which is called brain theory, B-R-A-N-E, coming from the word membrane, has it that gravity is some kind of relationship or interaction between different membranes, which uh, are the universes that we're in, and they are they provide they're strong between the membranes, but they're weak within each membrane, something like that. Uh, I don't know much about that, and I really haven't got a good grasp of it to say that. It makes much sense to me. It uh, it may make sense on a highly theoretical basis, but I don't think it has. I, it doesn't grab me intuitively. Uh, I I think I think there's something basically off about the whole idea. There's something new that mean, needs to be added, but we don't know quite what that is yet. But anyway, I'm wrestling with gravity right now, um, trying to get down to the gravity of this situation, and I hope to write another book. <laughs> Uh, beyond time, loops, and space twists, uh, which will get into gravity and try to explain 
what it is about gravity that's so mysterious and what it is that physicists are doing to try to understand it. Well, excellent. Well, when that new book comes out, you'll have to come back on the show and we can talk about gravity. Right. Um, <laughs> one of the things that you talk about in your book, and I'm just I'm looking at the clock, we have about eight minutes, um, was about particles going back in time. You know, like having a – please excuse – I'm trying really hard. They're, them having like a negative spin and they could go backwards in time. So you, I got very confused with some of the concepts. Um, but is that really possible? Yes. It's really possible, and it's something that uh, physicists have been working with for a long time. Um, one of the, one of the uh, uh, founders of that theory – uh, there have been several people who've, uh, who've who've made that theory part of their their package of un- theoretical understanding of quantum physics was uh, Richard Feynman. In fact, in the book Time Loops and Space Twists, I spent a lot of time going through Feynman's thinking because I found him to be an inspirational teacher, and uh, I thought that his way of explaining uh, how matter and so-called antimatter comes into being uh, was very important. When we get into the basis of reality that we call quantum field theory, it says that the fundamental units are, aren't particles, but they're fields which become particles. And the question is, what are these fields? What is the nature of these fields? And one thing that came up very clearly is that because of Einstein's relativity um, and our understanding of quantum physics, it turns out that you can't just have particles, ordinary particles coming into existence, going forward in time with positive energy. There must also exist, come into existence, particles going backward in time with negative energy. Now, this is going to be a little trick that you can play, but you can probably figure this out for yourself. If something is going forward in time, you can watch it on a movie, right? And you can say, ah, it went from right to left, let's say, all right? Now, suppose that somebody runs that film backwards through the camera. Well, then you're going to see that same thing going forward in time is now going backward in time. Remember, each strip, each little uh, um, frame of the movie is a particular time. So you go from, say, T equals zero to one to two to three to four to five. You run the thing backwards, it goes five to four to three to two to one. So that's what we mean by time going backwards. You got it now? Mm-hmm. Okay. So everything would go in the opposite direction. Well, it turns out that if something were really coming backwards through time towards us as we were going forward through time, what would it look like to us? Well, we wouldn't see five, four, three, two, one, even though that's what actually was happening, quote unquote, actually. We would see it going one, two, three, four, five. So even though it was going from left to right backwards in time, we wouldn't see it that way. We would see it going right to left forward in time. Do you follow what I'm saying there? Because we only watch things go one way in time. We don't watch things going both ways in time. You follow what I'm saying there? Yeah, it's a little, you know, you have to kind of twist your brain around a few times to make it work. It It, it would make things look, but I mean, it would make things look mysterious. That's uh, that's the only word I can think of. No, that's the whole point. They're not mysterious. They're straightforward. You just have to remember that something going backward in time looks to us as something going forward in time in the reverse order. And, and the, the little visual image that I had was somebody holding a glass of water, and so yeah. in forward time, they drop the glass of water on the floor and it breaks. But right. if it's going backwards in time, what we would perceive would be this broken glass of water on the floor going boop, 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 back into the no, person you can't. No, it wouldn't. Only, no, no, listen, this, this, is, this, this is confusing. We would never see that in actual fact. We would only see the glass fall, 
But if you imagine that time exists out there, not just the time of the moment that you're in right now, but there's an all-seeing time, okay, and that the future is there. And just like, just imagine a road. You're driving on a road, and that's the now, okay? There's a road ahead of you. That's the future. There's a road behind you. That's the past, okay? But the road is still there. Future, present, past, all together once, okay? Now, if something is coming backwards through time from the future towards you, it would be like a car coming towards you from from the uh, from the future coming back to you. But remember, you're driving the car forward through time. So what are you going to experience? You're not going to experience it that way. You're going to see it going the other way. It's a little tricky, I realize. But if you think about it a while, maybe draw some pictures, you can probably grasp this idea. But if that's that's the whole point. The whole point is that something going backwards in time to us, because we, if something went from from say uh, one o'clock in the afternoon to twelve fifty five, okay, and it went from right to left. Here we are, it's now twelve fifty five. What are we going to see? We're going to see something at twelve fifty five. Now at twelve fifty six, where is it going to be? Well, it's going to be in a different place, isn't it? And then at twelve fifty seven, a different place. Twelve fifty eight, different place. And at one o'clock, it's going <clears> to. <throat> be where it is at 1 o'clock. But from its perspective, it's going backward in time. <laughs> so for it, 1255 is like its future, but it's really not. It's our past. You see what I'm getting at here? It's just a matter of changing your thinking. And it, it, it's a little difficult to do, but anyway, if you do, you can get it. So that's what, that's what this is all about. In the book, there are pictures which will take you through yeah. this in a way that you can understand. You've got to draw pictures and make little drawings so that you can understand it. And there, I've got 70 pictures in the book, all basically there for you to play with and draw. And if you do that, you'll, I think the ideas will begin to emerge. It might take a little work on your time uh, and, and a little time, but it's well worth it if you want to expand your mind here. That's really cool. See, now you have my like brain all circling around and like, whew. <laughs> uh, let me see. Two minutes. Let's kind of wrap up here. The work that you're doing and and the work of quantum physics. How how is it? How does it? And and this is meant in the best of ways. But how it does it help us? You know, navigate the universe and. Uh, create a better world, I guess. Well, let's not worry about the world so much. Let's worry about our individual selves. How can we make life okay. for ourselves better as individual people? And the answer is, if you change the way you think about yourself and realize that you're not just a mechanical hunk of something that's uh, destined to do whatever you believe destiny holds for you, uh, if you realize that you have the ability to transform and change yourself, and my books and my writings and everything I do is to acquaint you with how and why that's true, I believe and I have sense that you generally become a happier person. And when you're a happier person, life is better for you, and as a result, it's better for others who are hanging around you or working with you or even on the bus with you, or when you're driving your car, or when you're going into the bank, or when you're doing this or that, or making love, or have a, finally a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or whatever you're doing in your life. If you have an expanded vision of who and what you are, as a body of light and the mind of God, for example, that's the metaphor I use, then I think your life can take on a whole new meaning. And things that you normally are afraid of will no longer hold fear for you. That, I think, is worth doing. Excellent. So your book, Time Loops and Space Trips, if somebody wants to get a copy? Any bookstore. Any bookstore. Just walk in, tell them who the author is, and I've got like 14, 15 books out there by now. Uh, just tell them who I am. 
tell them to my latest book, Time Loops. That's all I got to just You can say it's like Time Loops. You don't need to <clears throat> even have to remember the whole title. And they'll get it for you. If they won't, go online. Uh, you can find my name, Fred Allen Wolf, just by typing in into Google, for example, and you'll find out where you can buy the book. I've got a Facebook page I'm on. You can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I have a web page, fredallenwolf.com. If you go to any place where you mention my name, uh, you'll find how to get hold of the book. And uh, you can buy it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Almost any bookseller now has it. Excellent. Thank you, Fred, for coming on the show. I really appreciate you taking your time and putting up with my questions. So thank you, thank you, thank, thank you. Thank you, Rita. I appreciate your questions, and I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Thanks. That's Fred Allen Wolf. Again, his book is Time Loops and Space Twist. And we'll be back with Sonia Barrett after these words from our sponsors. Just Energy Radio with your host, Dr. Rita Louise, will return right after these messages. <laughs> 